All right, praise the Lord. All right, guys, my goodness. Whew, boy, I love that new song. That, uh, what is that, e it's Egypt? Would that be the name of it? Yeah, you know, it's, it's funny because I had uh, heard the chorus and remembered the chorus some, but uh, at first I'm thinking, man, this is, I haven't heard this song. And, uh, but I, when it got to the chorus part, I had heard, but that's great. That's such a wonderful song. It's really great, very scriptural, actually, about the Exodus and about what God delivered his people from. And uh, it kind of ties in. I know a lot of times <laughs> when, you, when we, as I get going in the message and you see, man, that, some of the music today was, uh, was about that or had some of that in it. Uh, and it's amazing how God brings things together like that. And, uh, and, and today we're gonna be looking at one of the heroes of the Exodus as an example for all of us about, uh, about a new understanding of God. And, and the reason that I'm bringing this up, you know, we started last week just a little short series about the grace of God. And last week, I basically introduced the, grace, the, the, the understanding of the grace of God because I have found that people never get closer to God than their concept of God will allow them to. Many people don't ever get close to God because their concept of God is not that God is warm and personal and desires to be with us and to love us, but that somehow God is some giant ogre in heaven just waiting to put a, a bat on us, that he is looking for a reason to condemn us and to judge us and to, and to come after us. So if that's your concept of God, then you're not ever gonna come close to God. You're not ever gonna wanna be around God. You're gonna run from God every, every opportunity. And, and so uh, I want us to close the distance today. I, I, I want us to, to get a new understanding of God's heart because if we understand God's heart, then you'll understand why you should cling to him and why you should crawl up into his lap and why you should pursue him at every point of your life and not be fearful of him and not condemn yourself and, con and, and allow others to condemn themselves as if somehow God is not going to accept them or want them or work in their lives unless somehow they meet some, you know, some standard. Because if God uh, is mad at you and God... Uh, uh, doesn't care about you and that God rules from a distance and he doesn't want to be personally involved in your life. If that's the way God is to you, then you're not going to get close to him and you're not going to pursue him and you're going to spend your life trying to dodge any real interaction with God. So let's see if we can remove some of these filters in our understanding of God uh, so that we can see him as he really is, and we can see the fact that he desires a relationship with you that is real, not cosmic, not ethereal, not plastic, not religious, you know, that is actually real, tangible relationship with you, and is personal, not just that he loves everybody, and, but, and he does, but that he loves you, personally. You know, I've mentioned the seven uh, realities of experiencing God, and that was uh, a series of understandings and so forth back that started back in the early 90s, really, Henry Blackaby and so forth. And, and the first reality was God is always at work around us. The second reality is God pursues a continuing love relationship with you that is real and personal. And so, this personal God who really, in, in reality, wants a relationship with you, not just that you would understand some set of beliefs and, and, and religious systems and so forth, but that you would have a relationship with him that is real, that you can feel, that you can sense, that you can experience, and, and is personal in your life. All right, so... How can we start to, how can we remove those filters that many of us have from our lives that 
keep us from having a real, true concept of the heart of God. Well, let's just start with this simple principle. The Bible tells us that God is good. Now, we're gonna put a couple of verses up here. Uh, Psalm 86, verse five. For you, oh, for you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive and abundant in mercy to all those who call upon you. Psalm 31, 19. Oh, how great is your goodness, which you have laid up for those who respect you. Psalm 33, five. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. And you could just go on and on and on because the Bible is filled in Old Testament and New Testament with passages that testify to the goodness of God. So the first little thought is, okay, God is good. Here's the second thought. Not only does the Bible tell us that God is good, the Bible also tells us that we are not good and that we are even evil in comparison to God. In Mark chapter 10, there's a story of the rich young ruler who came to Jesus, and he said to Jesus, good master, what must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus looked at him and said, why do you call me good? Don't you know there's none good but God? In essence, Jesus basically was saying to the rich young ruler, are you calling me good because you're calling me God? I mean, is that your, your reality? But the point there is that, that Jesus himself said that there is no one good except God. Of course, some people are good when you compare them to other people on the earth, but none of us are good. By comparison, all people on the earth are not good when you compare them to God. That's what Jesus said in Matthew 7. Here it is, Matthew 7, 11. He's talking about uh, fathers giving their children what they ask. If they ask for a, <coughs> for, a, for, a piece of, for a piece of bread, you don't give them a serpent or you don't give them a rock. And then here's what he says following that verse. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Now, I can imagine the disciples are hearing this now, and I can imagine the disciples looking at each other and saying, did, did he just call us evil? evil? I mean, come on, Jesus, you know. Well, well, yes, he did. He did just call you evil. And why did he do that? Because the best person on earth is evil, in comparison to God. Romans chapter three, verses verse 10, 11, and 12. Listen to it. As it is written, there is none. How many is none? <laughs> none is a, a zero with the, with the realm knocked off. There's none. There's none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is no, none who does good. No, not one. And why is that? A few verses later in verse 323, Romans, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All of us, every single person. Well, I believe I know somebody. No, no you don't. I'm not good. You're not good. No one that's ever lived on this earth is good because goodness only comes from God. We are born in a fallen state according to the word of God and, that, and, 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 we, and, we, and our only chance of goodness comes from God because goodness is one of the fruits of the spirit. You remember in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, I think I put that there, babe. Did I, did I, you're looking at it? Okay, I'll just quote it. Here's the fruit of the Spirit. For the fruit of the Spirit is. Now, the fruit of the Spirit means this is fruit that comes into your life when the Holy Spirit lives in you. That's what fruit of the Spirit means. It means if you don't have the Spirit, none of this fruit's in you. So the only way you get this fruit is that the Spirit is in you. For the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, uh, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, which means self-control. 
Goodness is one of the fruit of the Spirit, and the only way we get goodness is that God himself gives us this goodness. So the only real chance of us being good is to allow the Lord to fill us with himself. And there is no chance that we have have learned goodness from anybody in our life. Well, my mama was good. Well, I'm sure your mama was good compared to other people on this earth. I believe my mama was wonderful and great, and so was my dad. And all the other people in my life that I believe had good morals and good values, and man, they were just wonderful. Yeah, compared to other people in this earth. But they were not good enough to give me a model of goodness that could produce anything in my life close to the goodness of God. So the only chance we have at understanding God is a direct revelation of God. In other words, God to give us a direct, not through somebody, but a direct revelation of God. Now, has anyone ever experienced a direct revelation from God? Well, the answer is, uh, yes, there is someone. And we just sang about him in a song that called, that's called Exodus. And of course, you know, I'm talking about Moses. In Exodus chapter 33, God is at a crossroads in his relationship with Israel. In Exodus 32, Moses was on the mountain with God, receiving the Ten Commandments and spending 40 days and 40 nights with God. What was Israel doing at the base of the mountain? They were creating through Aaron, who is Moses' brother, uh, God allowed Moses the concession to take Aaron with him so Aaron could help do some talking because Moses didn't feel he could talk properly. God said, well, take Aaron with you. And the only thing Aaron ever did was cause Moses problems. And he built a golden calf because he was an, an ironsmith. And he built it, and the children of Israel were having an orgy dancing around this golden calf worshiping and throwing themselves on this pagan idol at the bottom of the mountain while Moses was on the top of the mountain watching the hand of God write the commandments on the stone. And he brought them down off the mountain. And when he got to the bottom, well, God had already warned him, you need to get back down there because those people of yours are messing up. And when he got back down there, he saw them dancing and, and you know, just throwing themselves and around this foolish pagan idol and he threw the commandments down and just broke them into pieces. And then he went back up on the mountain and spent some more time with God and God rewrote the commandments. And God told him while he was up there, he said, Moses, I'm going to honor my word to you and I'm going to take you and those wicked children of yours into the promised land. But listen to this. But my intimate presence will not be with you. Because if I stay with you, I'm going to have to kill somebody. Uh, they, I can't be around you uh, and, and, those, and those wicked kids of yours. Because they're just too much. Well, what's wrong? Well, God, God's frustrated with Israel. And, 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 and Israel frustrated with God. And, 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 and so God is going to give Moses a direct revelation of himself because Moses is in trouble. Moses is having trouble with God. He's having trouble with the people. And more importantly, he's having trouble with himself. And God says, Here, here's what you need, and I'm going to give you a direct, a direct revelation of myself. And so here is what we see in this interaction, because all of this is recorded in the Word. This is what we see in this interaction when God shows Moses who he really is. And I, in the outline, it's called, I call it four steps to a new understanding of grace, a new understanding of God. And, 
and God, who God is, God's heart. All right, step number one. Here's step number one. Realize that your understanding of God has been shaped by your past. In order to get a new understanding of God's heart, one that's different than the one you have, that's holding you back, that's keeping you limited, you have to realize that, it's, that, that, that you're that your understanding is messed up. And the reason that it's messed up is because you're looking at God through old eyes, through eyes of the past. M much of the resistance to what God's doing in our life is caused by our lack of understanding of God's heart. Moses had seen more miracles and performed more miracles than any man alive on this earth, but he really didn't know God. He had seen the power of God. He had experienced the, 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 the voice of God from a burning bush out in the middle of the backside of the desert somewhere. But, but Moses didn't really know God. He didn't, need, he didn't know God's heart. So Moses is still looking at God through old eyes. God, the children of Israel, and Moses, they've not gotten along since the day they met. When God first spoke to Moses and said, Moses, I want you to go down there and rescue my people, what did Moses say to God? Moses pushed back and said, no, send somebody else. I'm not going down there. And so God, I mean, right off the bat, Moses is, is, is pressing back against God. And that's when God said, all right, take Aaron and so forth and so forth. All right, so... Moses and God have this back and forth kind of relationship uh, and obviously there's frustration going on between them. God's frustrated, Moses frustrated. Well, the children of Israel, since the day they left Egypt, have accused God of bringing them into the wilderness to kill them. Every time something goes wrong, they don't have enough water. Why'd you bring us out of Egypt, out here in the desert? There wasn't enough graves back in Egypt, you gonna kill us out here? Every time they didn't have the right amount of food, God, they would gripe at God and blame Moses. You know. And then, uh, where are we going around in circles? Uh, the enemy's attacking us. And we're, I mean, from the very, right off the bat, everything that happened, Israel distrusted God. They believed, Israel believed that he was going to kill them out there in the desert. And that's the only reason he brought them out there. So a loving God hears their cries in Egypt and sends a deliverer down there to get them out. And the entire time that God is delivering them, they are accusing this loving, personal God whom they do not know, by the way, they are accusing this loving, personal God that is doing all of this for them of only doing it because he really secretly hates them and wants to destroy them. So there is, that, there is this back and forth relationship between God, Moses, and Israel, and God just finally looks at them and says, you are a stiff-necked people. So realize that your concept of God comes through eyes of your past. The hypocrisy you've seen from Christ, other Christians, the lack of forgiveness, the, 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 the hardness, the judgmentalism, the, the folly, the wrath of, of everybody that you've seen that is supposed to represent God and doesn't somehow do it have helped you form an opinion about God that is not true about God. That is not God. That's not God's heart. That's not God's life. God is not like that. So step number two then becomes, ask God for a fresh revelation of himself. Because that's the only way you're going to get a true concept of God is that he would give you this fresh revelation of himself. Look at Exodus 33. Tangents on the board. 
And Moses said, please show me your glory. Glory is, is the, the essence of your character. Your glory is uh, the, the outward manifestation of an inward reality. Your glory is what you're known for. If you're a loving person, then love is your glory. If you're, a, if you're an administrator and you're wonderful at it, then administration is your glory. Moses is saying, show me what you're known for, God. Show me who you really are. Show me the essence. I mean, he's not asking for some bright light like Shekinah. This is not Shekinah glory. This is the essence of who God is. Moses is saying, God, show me who you are, what you're known for, because Moses realizes, I think, that obviously he's missing something. I mean, God, I must be missing something because why would you even care about these stiff-necked people you're down here? So he asked God to reveal himself. Would you please show me your glory? And then in verse 19, then God said, I will make my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. That just means I am going to tell you who I am. I am going to proclaim my name. This is not gonna be a revelation through some other man. I, God, am going to proclaim who I am to you, and I'm going to let my goodness pass before you. So you see what God is saying, right? God is saying, you know what my glory is? My glory is my goodness. What I'm known for is my goodness. What makes me different from all of these pagan idols that you have down here, those things are full of hatred, full of vengeance, full of wrath. You got to sacrifice to them in order for them not to kill you. They hate you. They're after you. They are not good at all, but I am good, and that's my glory. So I'm going to let my goodness pass before you so that you can see who I really am because I, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So step number two is ask God to reveal himself to you. Step number three is receive from God's word a divine revelation of his goodness. Now this is what I'm saying to you. You're going to have to receive this from the word because the world is not going to show you his goodness and neither is anybody else. I can't show you the goodness of God. My goodness is incomplete. The only goodness I have, I've gotten from his Holy Spirit living on the inside of me and bringing the fruit of goodness in my life. You're not gonna be able to pick it up because most of the time the world amplifies, why did God do this? Why did he let this happen? Why doesn't he take better care of you? I thought you said you were a Christian. And the world is gonna condemn the goodness of God at all points, at all times. So the only place you are going to get an understanding of the goodness of God is from his word because his word is the truth. And that's one of the reasons why I asked you a few weeks ago, why do you believe the Bible is God's word? Is there a reason why you believe this? Or is it just something that granny said and you said, okay, well, that ain't gonna hold up now. You gotta have some roots. Why do you believe God's word? Because when God tells you something in his word, that's the truth. And if you don't believe that, then you don't receive any... Uh, peace from it. You don't receive any help from it. You don't receive anything from it because you don't believe it. Because the world is flashing, believe me, believe me, believe me, believe me. There are too many unanswered questions. God doesn't act that way. Why do you believe that? I knew a preacher one time. I knew my man. So you got to receive the truth about God from the word of God because it is the truth of God. So you, here it is. The, and this is the greatest passage in the Bible concerning who God is. Because God's going to let all of his goodness pass before Moses and he is going to proclaim his name, who he is. Exodus 34, verse five. Now the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. God's telling us who he is, himself. And here's what he says. 
And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. So there are seven attributes listed here of God's goodness. God says these seven things are, this is what I am. This is my goodness comprised of these seven attributes. Number one, I'm merciful. Last week I, I was talking about grace and I made the comment about every time you see God speaking of himself, he is the God of grace and truth. Grace always comes first. Grace is the first thing he wants you to know about himself because that is his greatest virtue. That's what he wants you to know about him, that he is a God of grace. Well, mercy is, is predominant in grace. Without mercy, you really couldn't have grace. But he, he, here he comes to Moses to reveal it. And his first attributes, he says, is I'm merciful. And here's the definition of mercy. Undeserved compassion that desires to help. That's a dictionary definition. Undeserved, everybody say undeserved. Say it again, undeserved. undeserved. Say, I don't deserve it. Deserve. Mercy is undeserved compassion that desires to help. Mercy keeps me from getting what I deserve. I deserve justice, but mercy keeps me from getting what I deserve. And this is amazing because God knows everything about us. I mean, God, God knows both good and evil about us. He knows everything about us, and yet he still wants to help me. I mean, God just doesn't see me through eyes of the now. God knows my past. He understands the devil's attack against us. He understands the corruption of the world around us. He understands our sin nature, our fallen nature, our weak flesh. He knows that we have tremendous lack of understanding and that we are helpless to change on our own, and yet he wants to help. He's compassionate for us in Moses' day, especially in Egypt. There was no concept of that. Uh, I'm a merciful God was unheard of. I mean, it, it, it's just like the people today who grow up in a family that, that, that there's not any sympathy or any compassion in. You grow up thinking that God is like that because you have a hard-nosed, unforgiving, judgmental father or you have a, 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 a mother who loves to rub it in and, 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 and never has any mercy or any grace in her life at all, you grow up thinking, man, God is like that. So we struggle with the concept of God because we don't understand God's heart. Now, here is the classic passage, and I've read this passage at least once in, in almost every service in the last six weeks, I know, maybe two months. So you'll, you, you'll know it by heart when you see it on the board. It's out of Hebrews 4. Look at what it says. This is what God says. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. So when you say, nobody knows how I feel, yes, they do. Jesus knows how you feel. As a matter of fact, Jesus reached levels of temptation that you'll never experience because you'll yield to the temptation before you ever get to that level. Because Jesus never yielded to sin, he went into regions of temptations that you and I will never experience because we can't last that long. So our high priest sympathizes with us because he truly does know how it feels. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The first attribute of God 
is his goodness. Here's the second attribute of God. He's gracious. The definition of grace out of the dictionary, listen to this. Free help on every level that is granted without merit or performance. Free help on every level that is granted without merit and without performance. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. Mercy is based on God's compassion. Grace is getting something that you don't deserve based on God's grace and not based on merit or earning it. Mercy is God's emotional disposition. Think about that. God's emotional disposition is to be merciful. Grace is what God does for us based on his emotional disposition of mercy. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8, look at this. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance of for every good work. All right, for a moment, I wanna just focus in on all grace. For God is able to make all grace abound toward you. Well, how much grace is there? All of it, he said. Well, what kind of grace would that be? Well, all right, mental grace, mental grace. Mental grace, John 16, 13. However, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. We all have human minds that are weak in some ways. We all have trouble comprehending certain things. So Jesus says, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will guide us into all truth. And why do we have to be guided into all truth? Because truth is not discovered. Truth is revealed. And so the Holy Spirit has to bring us into the revelation of truth and expose it or we'll never see it. And notice that it says, it, all truth he is the spirit of all truth. And I'm just asking you, what is it that your beady little mind can't grab hold of that it needs to grab hold of? I mean, I, I, I'm gonna use Justin as a, just a quick example. I hope I don't say anything too personal. Justin works in the engineering department at Mississippi Power Company. Uh, he has to learn um, FFA rules flight patterns, flight paths, designations, uh, heights, distances, FFA rules for flying an airplane. What does that have to do with engineering at Mississippi Power Company? Well, they want to start flying drones to check out power lines and so forth and do work in disasters and blah, blah with a drone. So that means that he has to learn 80 pages of FFA rules and regulations and so forth and then be tested on it. Now, does he know anything about the FFA rules or anything? Negatory. He knows nothing about them. They look like Greek because they don't make any sense to somebody that's not a pilot or doesn't care about being a pilot. So how is he going to learn stuff like that? Well, according to that verse right there, God will give mental grace to us, and the Holy Spirit who knows everything about every truth, if I will ask him, he will help me know what I need to know so that I can live the life that God has purposed me to live. Ask him. I need to know about the FFA rules, God. Can you help me learn these things? And the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth, who knows all the rules of the FFA, and everything else will say, let me help you. That is mental grace. And he will give you all grace, physical grace. We know about physical grace. We ask for it all the time. 
Romans 8 verse 11. But if the spirit who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. If the spirit of God can raise Jesus from the dead, do you think that any of your problems are gonna be a trick for him? No, he's got all that emotional grace. I've already read Galatians 5 or, or, or quoted it to you. Emotional grace. Do, do you know that every one, one of the fruit of the Spirit are emotions? Have you ever thought about that? Look at them. For the fruit of the Spirit is love, huh, joy, peace, long-suffering. That's what I need, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, which means self-control. All fruit, emotional, emotional grace. What does God do? His Holy Spirit comes into our life, fills us up with himself, and brings these emotional truths into our life. He will give you his personality. He will grow his character in your life. The capacity to love, the capacity to have joy, to have peace, and so forth, we don't have that capacity to properly manifest this fruit without his gift of grace. All grace, spiritual grace. Acts 1.8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. He will give you spiritual power to overcome the devil, to understand God, to live for God, to operate in the gifts of the Spirit. What is that? Spiritual grace. Financial grace. Oh, yeah, we're interested in that. 2 Corinthians 9, 8, the first verse that I quoted that said all grace. Look at it again. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you that you, here it is, always having all sufficiency in all things. Money, prosperity, peace, love, what? What does all sufficiency in all things mean? What is all? Uh, uh, all. <laughs> that I would have sufficiency in all things and that I ha may have an abundance for every good work. Hey, I'm not only sufficient, I've got an abundance to support any work God places in my heart financial or physical or spiritual or mental or emotional or whatever it might be. But, but you, uh, the only reason I mention financial is because the context of 2 Corinthians 9 is money. That verse is in the context of money because the Apostle Paul's trying to raise money for his mission and he's talking to the church at Corinth about raising money for his mission and that verse is one of the verses he says when he's talking about money. So that's the only reason I mentioned that. Um, so anyway. But you got to remember from last week, and I know you do because you remember everything I say. There's one condition for grace. You know what the condition is for grace? Okay, I got it. I have it. God is full of it. He's going to give it to me. But there's only one condition that God says I got to have if he's going to give me his grace. Let me show you in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. You know these verses. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. That's the gift of God. Not of works, so that none of us can boast about it. The only requirement for grace is faith. And faith does not mean just believing. Faith means acting. If you don't act on your faith, it doesn't matter what you believe. Can we hang that on the refrigerator? <laughs> I mean... What I believe does not matter a hill of beans in this universe if I don't act on what I believe. It's just in my beady little brain up here. 
But when I put that into action, that becomes a response of faith. If you will begin, let me just put it this way. If you will begin not only believing, but acting as if your father is merciful and gracious. Did you hear that? Let me just say it again. If you will not just believe, but if you will start acting as if your father is merciful and gracious, he will make all grace abound to you. Because God loves providing for you. God loves being your father. God loves being daddy, being papa. He loves doing that for you. That's what he says about himself. That that is his heart. That's what he loves to do for you. And so these are the attributes of God's goodness. All right. I'm going to stop there because I'm really only about halfway through. Is that good? Is that enough for y'all? You don't feel like you've been cheated? You want your offering back? We didn't give enough today for it? Okay, it's good. All right, because I don't want to overload you. Listen, you know what I found in life? I don't always obey it, but I found it. Um, man, your brain can't comprehend what your backside can't endure, you know? I mean, there are limitations in how much good you can get. And so, uh, anyway, I, I try to pay attention to that. Y'all know I don't always work it, but... I try to. All right, we'll start right here next week because really the rest of it, I don't want you to just fade out on it because it, it's, all, it's all real now. This is God describing himself saying, this is who I am. And if we can grab onto this, then we will have no trouble coming to God. We will have no trouble crawling up in his lap. We will have no trouble spending the rest of our life right there with him, allowing him to be our loving father that he is and neither would anybody else. This, these are the kind of things that we need to portray to others. This is the heart of God. Uh, Y'all have heard me say this many times. God's not nearly as picky as we are. And if you read his word, you will see people in the word of God that are champions and heroes that are just full of flaws, full of mess ups, full of everything. And God uses them anyway. And he makes a champion out of them. God can turn anything into greatness. He's already exhibited that. And he will do that in all of our lives if we will come close to him. That passage, the reason I, I read it so often in Hebrews 4 is because that's the key to the whole thing. He says, come boldly to me and climb up on my lap because I'm sitting on a throne. And it's not a throne of judgment. It's a throne of grace. And you do this, and I can give you grace and mercy before it's too late. Don't wait till it's too late. Come on now. Come up to Daddy's lap and tell Daddy what it is you need. Because I got plenty of it. And I want you to have it. I want all abundance in your life. All it requires is faith. All right, let's bow our head. We'll, we'll pick up there. Next.